Hello there, and welcome back to episode number 32 of Inside the Vault. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, uh, a Carolina Panthers podcast. We are uh, this podcast brought to you by the Keep Pounding Podcast Network, where you can find on Twitter at KP Pounding underscore FSSN. And this podcast is powered, as you know, by the Fans First Sports Network, which you can find on Twitter at Fans First SM. My latest guest here on Inside the Vault, he is the host of the Al Wallace Show from 2 to 3 Eastern Time on 7.30 the game. Former Maryland Terrapin, former defensive end for your Carolina Panthers from 2002 to 2006, including Super Bowl 38. Um, played in the NFL uh, after being uh, undrafted free agent in Jacksonville as well, and then played also for the Eagles, Dolphins, Bears, and Buffalo. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at 96A Wallace. Al Wallace, welcome to Inside the Vault, my man. How's it going? Uh, it's good. It's going really well. I appreciate you having me on and uh, taking some time. I know it's been a long time coming. Uh, I apologize for that just busy schedule, but absolutely love, you know, talking Carolina Panthers football and kind of reminiscing and, of course, talking about the team and the expe expectations for this year. Yeah. Well, I want to jump back uh, in time before we get to the current version of Panthers. Let's talk about you for those who may not um, recall your career or uh, just may not be as familiar with your background. So you played uh, at Spanish River Community High School in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, you were a running back your junior year and then your senior year, uh, a two-way player at receiver and linebacker. And then, as I said at the top, you go to the University of Maryland where you play receiver but you were switched to linebacker. So my question to start off the podcast is, uh, obviously you played def defense in the NFL, but um, did you want to play offense and you just got switched to defense? Or how did your uh, defensive role uh, future in football come about, I guess? Yeah, that that's a wild story. Um, I played primarily offense uh, through Pop Warner in high school. I went from a running back, kind of had a growth spurt, between my junior and senior season, I got switched over to wide receiver. Uh, my very best friend to this day was our quarterback, so that helped. He was throwing me the ball. Uh, yeah. He was a year older, got a scholarship, went off to Western Kentucky. But I played wide receiver. I left, and I touched down in College Park, Maryland, 92, at about 6'2", 180, 185 pounds. And I survived as a wide receiver for about two days. So we got there before the upperclassmen. Uh, were there, uh, and I was a you know six two wide receiver back in nineteen ninety two, um, and then we had this day. So we practice on a Friday. We have two practices on a Saturday. The upperclassmen are reporting on Sunday, and they decided to have a little fun with that practice. We were all worn out. They wanted to make sure we were still you know ready to go when the when the older guys got there. So they said, hey, all the offensive guys, you pick a position. And we're going to throw you on defense. All the defensive guys pick a position. We're going to throw you on offense. And all of us had done it in high school, uh, which was great. Um, I decided to be an outside linebacker, you know, bigger guy, edge rusher. And we actually had a practice. They let us go through individual and, and do those types of things. I obviously flashed something. They saw the frame. Um, later on that afternoon, the upperclassmen got in and they said, hey, can you do the thing that you did in practice? Just pass rush. And they put me up against some real offensive linemen. And the speed was there. The frame was there. I go back in the locker room. I was number 86 when I went out to practice. I go back in the locker room. My number is now 56. I uh, get red shirted. Uh, by the time I went home to fast forward for, um, you know, fall break or winter break uh, for the holidays in December, I had grown three inches and gained about 45, 50 pounds and was a defensive end from there. So wild ride, wild story. My body just took to the training, the training table, um, all those types of things really quickly. And uh, you're talking about turning into a different human being overnight. It, it was a wild ride. But yeah, wide receiver to defensive end. Yeah, that's a good uh, story and wild, like you said, and our listeners, I'm sure, will appreciate the background uh, information on that. Um, but as we know, this podcast is about you in the professional leagues as a Carolina Panther. So um, as a senior, you did start nine games, 40 tackles, and then you were um, finishing your college career with 12 sacks, 108 tackles. And as I said, you went undrafted to Jacksonville, and then you made some stops in Philly, Chicago, and Miami. And then on July 19th, 2002, 
you were traded to the Carolina Panthers, along with Colin Branch, safety uh, uh, from back in the day for the Panthers as well. And for the listeners who may not be as familiar, um, I'll just kind of read uh, what uh, a few things I found on my research. Um, you backed up uh, Mike Rucker and uh, this guy named I think Julius Peppers. I, I think I <laughs> yeah. think I got it. I got that guy right. Um, right. In 2003, uh, 38 tackles, five sacks, nine quarterback hurries, five passes defended, and two interceptions, all the way to Super Bowl 38 that year. And he. Um, Played a key role in special teams that year as well, blocking five kicks in the first two games of the season. But really, it was you, Chris Jenkins, Julius Peppers, Mike Rucker, Brinson Buckner, that formidable defensive line during your tenure with the Panthers 2002-2006, which honestly a lot of people thought was the best in the league in that time span, uh, at least for these those few years in 2002, 2003, 2004. So I say all that. Just before we get into the current state of the Panthers um, – you played for about five or six NFL franchises, including Carolina. What was it like playing with Coach Fox, or for him, I should say, and with the Panthers? I mean, Coach Fox was great. Um, <clears throat> he was a player's coach, uh, played the game, coached the defensive side of the ball. Uh, that was really refreshing. I think he knew when to push us in 2002. And I remember getting traded. I mean, you think about July 19th. That's a couple of weeks out from reporting to Spartanburg. Yeah. Um, so I get that call from my agent and he's saying, hey, I got good news and bad news. I was on a futures deal with the Miami Dolphins, who was my, you know, hometown, home state team at yep. the time. And I uh, had to drive to Spartanburg, South Carolina, a place I had never been, Wofford College, and was so much uncertainty. Uh, I was working as an assistant principal of a high school prior to that. No uh, kidding. Talked about the road. You talked about the bumps along the way. Uh, the NFL just had not been kind. I just didn't get that big break, but I knew that I was a guy that would fight and scrap and do what it took to be the best possible teammate. And John Fox gave me that opportunity. And if there's one thing uh, that I remember clearly about setting foot in Spartanburg, he said, if you can play, you can play. I don't care what you were doing, you know, three weeks ago as an assistant principal of a high school. If you can play, we're going to find a way. And Jack Del Rio, the defensive coordinator, um, back that and Mike Turgovac, who was the defensive line coach now yes. go back to Philadelphia where I kind of had a breakout um, season uh, along with Hugh Douglas on that team great uh, Mike Mamula Boston College guy was on that defensive line as well uh, and, and ripped off I think six and a half sacks so Mike Turgovac was that coach when they had the trade on the line they looked at that Miami Dolphins roster and they asked Mike Turgovac would, would be uh, which one of the guys on the, that defensive line he would take and he saw my name and he brought me here so I am forever grateful for Mike Turgerback for um, you know being in my corner and giving me really a second life to my career but John Fox was great he's one of my favorite coaches uh, of course bounced around a lot but when he taught us that first year 2002 they asked us and you hear it all the time smart and tough and I knew that I, I fit both of those molds so I knew I had a shot yeah um, I mentioned Julius Peppers. We'll get to the Super Bowl in, in a second. Um, you mentioned Julius Peppers, as I said. Um, obviously, he's a, now a first ballot Hall of Famer, just got named into the Hall of Fame. Um, just your memories playing with Julius Peppers and, and not just him, but the, that D line that I mentioned earlier. What are some of your memories playing with those guys? What was it like? Brothers, um, you, you name those guys. I mean, Buck is still one of my best friends, Brinson Buckner to this day. Um, Mike Rucker, we, we're always around at the stadium and doing work in the community. Um, Chris Jenkins, another Maryland guy uh, that yeah. came into Maryland as I was exiting. So I was there kind of on the tail end when he was getting recruited by the team. You know, those starting four. And then I was the swing guy for the defensive ends, backing up Ruck and, and Pep. And then uh, the name we, we left off of there was Shane Burton, big, big Shane, big country guy, right. yes. University of Tennessee. So we were affectionately known as the Carolina Six Pack and still have posters and things with, you know, the images of us six uh, being able to go in and have that solid rotation. Now, this is 2002. This is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, world champ. You got Warren Sapp and Simeon Rice and those uh, guys that really were the standard at the time. So for us to come in in 02 and then definitely in 03 and, and raise that level, um, 
it, it, we were great. I thought we were the best defensive line, not only uh, in that era, but I think in Carolina Panthers history. Uh, of course, I'm a little bit biased in that, but you look at Pep and what he brought to the table, an absolute beast and Chris Jenkins, who Derek Brown, who just got a new deal, reminds me of a whole heck of a lot. Then we had the, the elder statesman, Brenton Buckner, who he got us all lined up. He got us all coached up, and that's why he became a coach post-career. So, yeah, what a great time. What a great defensive line and, and Pep was an absolute freak that's what comes to mind when I think about him and um, how exciting and when I look back on it being able to play alongside and with a guy that is a hall of famer is just absolutely amazing what is your memories playing uh, in Super Bowl 38 uh, obviously the game didn't go how we all wanted it to go but um, just your memories playing in Houston uh, back in 2004 it was great. And, and it took 10 years, believe it or not, Ryan, for me to go back and watch Super Bowl 38 to really sit down and, and relive that moment. Uh, heartbreaking after you see Adam Vinatieri uh, kick the ball through the uprights after Tom Brady, who really wasn't that Tom Brady at the time, lead that final drive. Um, after John Casey, you know, the ball goes out on, on the kickoff um, after we get a, a late touchdown there. But my memory is just fighting and scrapping and uh, Jake DeLome and record-breaking reception uh, to Musa Muhammad, Deshaun Foster with one of the most iconic dives in the end zone of all time, Stephen Davis, and uh, Dan Morgan. Again, general manager Dan Morgan set a yes. Super Bowl record with tackles. So those things are fresh in my mind when I recall that time, uh, that road, that path up to it. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, a part of uh, a podcast series that the Panthers put together um, called the Cardiac Cats and got to relive that all over again. Just from start to finish, game one in Jacksonville that, you know, double overtime, all the block kicks in Tampa uh, through going and facing Peyton Manning, 0-5 uh, and 0-6 respectively and getting that done on the road. Amazing ride. Uh, that Super Bowl was just electric. And it was everything that I dreamed about as a little kid, watching the flash bulbs go off and running down on the kickoff and going out there and taking on the Patriots and really giving them all that they wanted and walked away proud. That's the, that's what I remember. That's what I still hold dear today that we were proud of what we put out there. You lost and life would have been certainly different. At, we had won a Super Bowl, but very proud of my teammates and the performance we put out there that I can relive every single year when the Super Bowl season comes around. Yeah, I, I remember watching one of those Patriot documentaries, and uh, and I don't know if Tom Brady was just saying this to be Tom Brady, but I, I do remember him saying they uh, specifically talked about the that Super Bowl against the Panthers, and he was saying Carolina was easily the best defensive line that they had played that entire season. And he said, uh, I think it was the first couple of series, he got hit a few times, and he said, uh, he's like, okay, this is going to be a different game than we've experienced all season. And, uh, and so he's like, we had to bring it. And so anyways, I just, I remember Brady saying that from that game. Um, a little bit of a different question uh, that I'm, I, I might be putting you on the spot from this. Um, if there's a play in your career that you'd like to have back, and I know there's many, but is there like one that comes to mind that you would just like to have back something that really sticks out? Well, I, you know, th this play, I think I got attached to Chris Sims for, so uh, there's a situation we're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, Chris Sims, uh, you know, the son of Phil Sims is the quarterback at the time and he's a lefty. So they're down in the red zone. Um, and we, we have all these alerts, right? We have all these keys. And my first responsibility is to make sure there's no bootleg. There's no reverse coming to my side. So we're down on the goal line and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way Chris Sims is, is pulling this ball and uh, for a bootleg, he can't outrun me. He's not that athletic. And uh, I go for the fake and uh, I tackle the fake and Chris Sims walks in the end zone and Sal Sinceri, he just tears me a new one, man. It is the longest walk back to the sideline. He's frothing at the mouth. My teammates are saying, man, we just, told I mean, I can remember Dan Morgan just laser eyes. Like we just talked about this, but I wanted to make a play. Uh, later on in that game, uh, I was able to redeem myself by uh, they ran it again. Here's here's the you know, here's Al Wallace. He's going to mess it up. It's not Peppers. It's not Rucker. Uh, we do it again. I drill him. Uh, I nail him. 
Um, fast forward, he leaves that game with a ruptured spleen. Uh, have a poster, and I can remember inside the NFL, his dad calling me a dirty player. Um, so, you know, I don't regret the hit. I was doing my job, but I certainly regret letting my teammates down, you know, a few series before that and giving up a critical touchdown uh, down there in the red zone. There have been so many. Um, I was so cold in Cleveland in one play. I, I, you know, got down in my stance, couldn't feel my hands and fell into the neutral zone and got a penalty. So just bloopers <laughs> like that, you know, but yeah. I think my effort and the things that I did on the field, I went hundred percent. I was undrafted. I didn't have any wiggle room not to give everybody everything I had. So no regrettable moments in, in that way, but certainly, you know, some blooper type moments that uh, I wish I could have back. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, last two, and then we'll pivot to the uh, current state of the 2024 version of the Carolina Panthers. Um, what's something that fans uh, don't know about um, playing in the NFL that, you know, may seem obvious or it may not seem obvious that um, is interesting or uh, insightful, you think, um, that people would find Interesting. Yeah, that one's difficult because there's so much access now. So you have hard knocks and you have all these behind the scenes uh, opportunities to kind of pull the curtain back. Uh, but just coming from my perspective, right, undrafted, I was considered a tweener coming out of Maryland in 97, not quite big enough to be uh, a defensive end. You know, you, you think of some of those guys in that era, it was a run heavy, run first offense. So you had to be 280 to 90. Um, but also never dropped in coverage, not very good. I thought, I think they figured in space. Um, so that tweener label, uh, which is hilarious now because there's not yeah. even defensive ends. They're called edge guys, which, you know, I would have been perfect for today's game and, and coming out of college now um, with my size and speed. But I think what, what fans don't realize is um, the mental side of it. And I know you know we have huge playbooks and you study uh, the game, but I think for me, being able to make the transition from Maryland to the pros, um, and the thing I prided myself on is being able to know multiple positions, being able, being able to be a student of the game, understanding everything that went around me so that if there was was a gap in maybe my skill set I would be able to kind of plug that up with anticipating where a run was going and uh, my favorite Carolina Panther of all time uh, as far as from a cerebral standpoint is Luke Keekley. bar none no one understood studied the game prepared harder than and more than Luke Keekley. So to see the clips of him calling out plays, getting his guys in the right spot was absolutely uh, fantastic. And I played with a lot of great veteran guys. Brinson Buckner was my guy, a 12-year NFL vet. And like I said earlier, getting us lined up, uh, being able to recognize uh, stances of offensive linemen, um, recall things from film study. So being able to be a student of the game, I think maybe fans don't understand that. You look at the combine and all the things that – um, are coveted are the the physical traits right height weight speed uh, explosiveness all those types of things but we're now seeing that they're doing tests that they're studying guys processing abilities and the cerebral game uh, in the NFL distinguishes a, a college football player from a pro and for me uh, I was able to stick around a long time because um, I became a student of the game yeah um, you mentioned a couple of guys there uh, on who were Keegley Buckner guys that you played with that were, um, you know, vets and guys that you thought were, you know, very talented players. What is the most underappreciated Panther player that you've played with? Uh, someone who feel like doesn't get enough recognition. Yeah, this is easy. Um, and I talked about it on my show uh, recently. One of the most un uh, underrated, just you don't even know who feels like he existed in the entire uh, pantheon of great Panthers players. And that's Chris Gamble out of Ohio State. This guy leads the organization in interceptions. He was a rock solid cornerback uh, for so many years here with this team. He was quiet, so you wouldn't know about him, right? You think about Josh Norman. Uh, you know, we had Reggie Howard and Terry Cousins. They were our two corners. Uh, and then Ricky Manning Jr., a rookie that uh, had three interceptions in the NFC Championship game. But yes. Chris Gamble was exactly the prototype 
cornerback that exists in the game now. 6'2", long arms, physical, was you know willing to come up and, and play the run and run support, um, but also great in space. And, and think about the guys in that era that he had to cover the Randy Mosses and the Chris Carters. I mean, uh, Chris Gamble, was, he was unbelievable. He's never going to be mentioned when you start making lists of your top Panthers of all time. He belongs in the top 10. Uh, he was the best corner in franchise history. I would agree with that. That's a um, he, He's very unappreciated. I would definitely agree with you on that. Um, let's pivot now to the current state of the Panthers. 2023 is uh, was a rough season, 2-15, uh, and 15, yeah. as we know. You've stated it plenty of times on your show. But we can't get to 2024 without talking really quick about 2023. So give us your 30,000-foot view of 2023 Carolina Panthers season and just um, just a quick recap on, on your version of events. Well, I think it starts a year ago. Uh, this team hires uh, a Maryland guy, Frank Reich, and they're going to bring him in. He's a former quarterback uh, in the NFL. He played for this organization. Um, he's worked with some top, you know, uh, quarterbacks around the NFL. And, and you just know, you know, the Panthers are, are going to draft a quarterback. So you're thinking, who better, an offensive minded guy, a veteran coach, a play caller to come in. And then we start to see the roster, right? They start to build this uh, like Avengers is what I called it on my show. It's, it's like the, they assembled all these guys. And you think about Josh McCown and, and, and Caldwell and all these guys that are going to uh, come in and build this incredible coaching staff, which was a, a stark difference from the Matt Rule era, right? All the college guys, it, it didn't really work. They didn't captivate or catch the attention of the guys in that locker room and it fizzled out. So here we go, right? We're going to get a number one overall pick. It's either going to be CJ Stroud or Bryce Young, uh, we all thought. And then Frank Wright with this coaching staff with Deuce Staley uh, to kind of, you know, be, be the, the tone setting guy. So many great names and personalities. And what they lacked was what the game is all about. And that's teamwork. It felt disjointed. And when I think about the season, it felt fractured from the beginning because we watched, um, you know, all of these pro days happen. We get the video now. So we see them, you know, with CJ Stroud and Josh is talking about playing hoops in Charlotte. Then we see him go to Tuscaloosa and here's Bryce Young and you see the Teppers uh, together with Bryce Young and you're confused, right? Is it a consensus? They told us it was, but it wasn't. So, so much pressure on Bryce Young. Um, bring in Miles Sanders. That didn't work out. Uh, the receiving core underwhelmed uh, Adam Thielen to think that he would come in at 30 plus years old, 10 year vet to be the number one wide receiver. It was all over the place. And when yeah. I look back on 2023, that's what I would remember. Uh, a bunch of guys, 53, throwing the coaches that weren't a team. It never gelled that camaraderie, that thing that made us the cardiac cats, the Carolina Panthers, even go look to the 2015 team with Cam Newton. There was no glue there. Shaq gets hurt. Here's the Brian Burns controversy and contract issues, and you never get off the ground. And that thing just went south. You start on six, you go into the bye week, and Frank Wright's out, and everything else goes, you know, to the left. And, Man, what a miserable season to be a former player, um, to cover this uh, in the media, but a fan of football. I live here in the Carolinas. My family's here. And to, to watch this team um, be considered one of the worst organizations in the NFL, I mean, it hurt me to my core. So those are my memories. The X's and O's, I mean, what do you say? It just wasn't good football. It wasn't Carolina Panther brand of football. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing to talk about there, but it was the overarching theme that where's the team, where's the fight, where, 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 where's that Panther, where's the keep pounding in this organization it was completely lost. Yeah. Well, let's try to get into, uh, the 2024 version now of what we're building and, uh, you, positives and negatives, I know, but, uh, we'll try to keep it as real as we can. Um, I'll start with what you just brought up um, a few minutes ago. Uh, oh, actually, a little farther back. Uh, Derek Brown did just get resigned very recently, a new contract extension. Um, obviously, fans are going to talk about it. You know, the Brian Burns situation could have been avoided. You know, that's water under the bridge at this point. He obviously was traded. Talked about that in my last podcast. Um, thoughts on the Derek Brown resigning, number one. You said he reminded you of Chris Jenkins. And number two, um, should the Panthers sign Stefan Gilmore? I know Clowney's talked about that. Uh, someone we also just signed as well. 
Um, so Derek Brown contract first, and then number two uh, is Stefan Gilmore, a good reunion for the Panthers as well. Yeah, let's let's talk about Derek Brown because uh, from an interior defensive lineman standpoint, to go out and have 100 plus uh, tackles to play over 85 percent of the snaps, the durability. This you know go back a couple of years. I think 2021 is his second year in the NFL. He's benched for a few games, right? He's he's become a rotational piece, and you're just thinking. Man, this guy was a stud in the SEC, defensive player of the year in that league. Uh, so big, so dominant, uh, couldn't be stopped. And then you get to the NFL. And Ryan, what I saw was a guy that was overthinking it. Football is just not that hard. You saw a big <laughs> man who was trying to be too technical. He was trying to be uh, coachable. And I saw him thinking about his hands and his footwork and his body position and leverage and those types of things. And he got away from what made him the best raw interior talent coming out in that draft class. And the reason why I compare him to Chris Jenkins, because that's who Chris was. Technique, ah, who needs technique? I'm the biggest, baddest 350-pound man uh, on the planet. And that's how he played. Once Derrick Brown decided that he was not going to be blocked, that he was just bigger and stronger and more devastating than everybody else, he completely took over. So I thought from an impact standpoint, point the Panthers knew they needed to to pay him uh because of all the things that happened with Brian Burns not taking the the trade uh with the Rams then not getting him signed prior to the 2023 season they had to make a statement not only to um the the league but to the guys in the locker room if you yeah. perform we'll pay you we'll pay you and I think Dan Morgan did a great job of of making that known that hey he you earned it you're dominant uh, the sack numbers don't need to be there. And I had a big gripe about that. I thought they did for him to be, you know, top two or three um, defensive, paid defensive tackles in the league. Yeah, he, just just be the man in the middle. So Josie Jules, you know, new acquisition. Um, yep. You look at Wanham and, and uh, you, you know, all the rest of the guys, they're going to feed off Derrick Brown because he is a black hole in the middle of that defense the same way. Uh, Dan Morgan himself thrived off of Chris Jenkins, which makes so much sense when you think about it. Th that kid is absolutely incredible. I, I love to watch him uh, play. Uh, I love to watch him dominate from his defensive tackle position. And then when you look at Stephon Gilmore, yeah, why not? Right? Yeah, he's an older guy, but it's not about the speed and explosiveness. He's savvy. Look at what he did in his brief time here, uh, the first trip around. He's going to figure out where to be. And I told you how cerebral the game was earlier here on the podcast. You bring him in, uh, he, the connection to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to Jadavion Clowney. Um, he doesn't have to be your main guy, right? He doesn't have to be uh, your, your second cornerback. He can be a guy that you can bring in in passing situations as a nickel or bump somebody else into the nickel. Uh, now that you have Dane Jackson as well. So I'm yep. all for it. Also, uh, Ryan, with vets, they're not excited to get in here and do voluntary workouts. They don't care about OTAs. So right. with a guy like, uh, even with Clowney, um, Stefan Gilmore, you wait. You wait. If you think you can get him, if you've had that conversation, just like I think the Frank Reich staff had with Justin Houston, you wait until training camp. You let those guys do their personal workouts wherever they want to do those. And you bring them in, you get as much as you can out of them in this 2024 season. Yeah. Um, my last uh, kind of big picture question, then we're going to go specifically into kind of the 2024, what we're planning here. Um, we talked about Derek Brown and rewarding him, uh, avoiding a Brian Burns situation, which we obviously um, did have. Um, you know, I asked this to, I think, uh, one of my past guests. So I'll ask this as a former player, I'll ask this to you. Uh, how does it sit in the locker room? I, I know you're not there, but – you know, DJ Moore, trade. Christian McCaffrey, trade. Brian Burns, now trade. Um, you know the fan base. You were a player, obviously. Um, is it something, is it simply as simple as fans think of it as, okay, we have these homegrown talents that we just ship off to other teams and they reap their rewards and we're just here left suffering? Or is it not that simple you know McCaffrey had his injury issues uh DJ Moore the Bears weren't going to complete that trade without Brian Burns DJ uh Moore or Derek Brown and then obviously Brian Burns you already talked about the contract is it really that simple or is it something that you know maybe we're missing 
Yeah, it's pretty much that simple. And each one of those scenarios, I was in agreement with the move, believe it or not. Christian McCaffrey was coming off of a few, uh, you know, injury riddled seasons. He plays the running back position. We can have a whole show on how the NFL views running backs. Um, $16 million a year. He was getting paid highest paid running back in the NFL. It was time to go. When you look at the importance of position, even though you were bringing in a number one overall pick rookie quarterback, uh, you tried to, or you had to get better in other areas. So for them to move up and value the importance of a franchise quarterback over your top wide receiver. I get it. You go for the quarterback, Brian Burns. um, Look, I play with his brother, Stanley. It's always been a tough conversation for me to uh, criticize Brian Burns. I didn't like what I saw from him. And that is based on the player and the personality that I have. And, you know, we, we did the whole story about how I came into the NFL and undrafted. I don't understand how a guy uh, goes out and and plays, you know, half the time or fearful of injury. We all fear the injury. It's part of the game. But he told us that it was bigger than his contract, that he was going to show up for training camp, that he was going to show up for the season. Then you have to play. So that turned me off with Brian Burns a little bit. Um, Again, they missed the boat. They didn't get the two first round picks in the second from the Rams. They didn't pay him. I just don't think they believed in Brian Burns as much as the fan base uh, did. Now, how does the locker room feel? How do you feel as a player? You don't care, right? You don't take it personally. We always said that's the business part of it. And I think uh, for the guys in the locker room, what they want to do is bring in as many people that can help you be successful. Now you lose the leadership in a locker room guy like McCaffrey and Burns and, and DJ. It hurts the locker room. And you heard it from Shaq, I think last year. Yep. The guy said, man, you got to get them paid. We need them. But at the end of the day, you understand that part of the business. It is very simple. Um, I think it's a result of just missteps uh, all the way to the top with David Tepper. Then you, you look at Scott Fitterer and how they handled the scouting and the drafts. And again, whole other show Uh, these guys just want to win so things happen you hate to see your your homegrown products your top picks uh, go off and have success with other teams it's part of the business but it starts at the top with the owner and then the general manager and a few coaches that just did not get this right and that's why you're sitting here with Dan Morgan Dave Canales so hopeful going into a new season so yeah let's get into that now Uh, Dan Morgan hired to replace Scott Fitterer we talked about him former teammate of yours and then Dave Canales uh, to replace Frank Reich. He coached Baker. He coached Russell. He coached Gino. Um, so your quick um, analysis on Dan being promoted and then Dave being brought in to be our new head coach. Um, what are your thoughts on them uh, as a whole? Yeah, I'm going to start with Dan, uh, former teammate. Uh, he was our leader. Uh, the eyes in the middle of the line, uh, you know, huddle. Uh, getting us all lined up. Dan was the Luke Keekley before Luke Keekley. Intelligent, I say. Yep. physical. It was an absolute animal. And when he spoke, you listened. So uh, sitting there in his press conference alongside uh, a lot of former players, for him to make the statement that this team needed to get back to finding dogs, right? I've yep. been saying that. Everyone's been saying that. It did not shock any of us because that's who Dan Morgan was. And you look at some of the acquisitions and uh, people he's brought into this organization, Robert Hunt and, um, you know, Damian Lewis from the Seattle Suit. These guys are dogs. They are animals. They're going to go out there and raise the level of physicality. So um, Dan's a guy who who got it out of the mud, man. You look at, you know, being a, a low level scout in Seattle. Uh, working his way up and and getting an opportunity with Brandon Bean in Buffalo. Now then coming here and working with Scott Fitterer and then uh, at all those bad things that I talked about a few minutes ago happening and having enough confidence to go sit in front of David uh, and Cole Tepper and whoever else is in the room saying, I can get this thing done. I can connect this roster, this fan base back to the essence of what it means to be a Carolina Panther. And I said it earlier, it's about Sam Mills, it's about keep pounding. Dan is that connection. He brings that with him. He sat with Sam Mills since he was a rookie in 2001. So if anybody understands what this organization, what this town, what this franchise needs is Dan Morgan. And you can see it. He's not going out and getting the flashy names. He's going out and getting football players. 
guys that fit like a puzzle that's going to work. They're going to protect Bryce. They added some weapons. And, man, am I super proud of my former teammate and love that he's gotten this opportunity with, with the Carolina Panthers, which is, you know, the cherry on top. Now, Dave yep. Canales, a uh, few conversations during, you know, after that press conference. And I said it today on the show, the thing that's impressed me the most is that I feel motivated. We talked about John Fox, like he knows his, he knows his X's and O's. He feels good about it. And that's that Pete Carroll um, kind of school of getting guys where they need to be. When I look at Baker, he made Baker believe in himself again. The NFL had beaten Baker Mayfield down. The media had destroyed Baker as an incompetent quarterback. Dave Canales gave it back to him. I'm going to show you how to get the ball out of your hands. You're going to be able to do it, throw it to Mike Evans. We're going to win some football games. I picked the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to be dead last in the NFC South. Baker Mayfield had a resurgence. Mike Evans does exactly what he does every year of his 10-year career. And uh, Dave Canales is part of that. So I'm excited to see what they can do um, with Bryce Young to get some of the confidence. I'm sure it was lost last year in a very disappointing rookie season for the number one overall pick. Yeah, I, I picked Tampa as well. Guilty as charged on that one. Um, Ijera Averro, you're a defensive guy. Um, obviously, he's done a great job with our defense. Uh, will he be, still be in Charlotte after this year? Uh, and what do you think of his coaching style as a whole? How How's he done in his now going into his second year in Carolina? Yeah, the guys love him. Uh, and when you have a conversation with him, you know that he's a smart guy, that he's an aggressive guy, that he commands a room. And I like that. Uh, for Vero, I thought he would be one and done this year. Of course, with the season being what it was, um, it, it, it made it difficult. Even though I think he did the most with the least uh, for this defense to be a top 10, top five ranked defense, just going out there, uh, Brian Burns, eight sacks, you know, Derek Brown doing what he's doing, then the injuries to Shaq, uh, JC, Dante, somebody's always banged up, right? Um, no real pass rush, and he finds a way to uh, continue to prove that he's one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL. My answer to will he be a coach, a head coach next year? Yeah, and I think, it, it you know, it's deeper than that. You can go and look at the plight of the African-American coaches in the NFL um, and those types of things. This guy is smart. He deserves it. He's earned it. He has not gotten that opportunity. Um, but is he capable? Absolutely. And now you bring in Ashawn Robinson, you get some some help on the edge with with uh, with Wanham uh, coming from the Minnesota Vikings. This thing looks to be fun. Uh, if he was able to do what he did last year with that group, I think it's significantly better on that side of the ball. We talked about Stefan Gilmore. I'm excited because if that defense goes out and performs the way it did last year, the offense is going to get better. They're going to be able to perform a lot better. You're going to get more out of Miles, uh, Miles Sanders um, because schematically it's going to be better suited, I think, for his skill set. I love Chuba Hubbard and the toughness he brings on that side of the ball. Uh, so, yeah, um, I love it. I think uh, Canales has got these guys or Dan Morgan has, has put this roster. He's putting the roster together here just, what, 17 days before the draft. Um, but I'm excited to see what Averro can do, what Canales is going to do as far as getting Bryce Young pointed in the right direction after 2023. Uh, and that'll be my last one before we get some predictions to get you out of here. Um, Bryce Young, uh, number one overall pick last year, as we talked about earlier. Um, what did you see from him coming out uh, this rookie season? And um, and then I'm combining like three questions in one. What is his to-do list if you were in charge of Bryce Young this offseason? I think the first thing you do if you're Bryce Young and, and certainly bringing those bodies in on the offensive line helps, right? It's getting back uh, the confidence, the mental game, the mental part of it. He was a surgeon at Alabama. This guy was confident behind that big offensive line that Nick Saban put together for him, all those four and five star recruits, right? He was able to do his job, meaning stand in the pocket and to, to deliver the ball to great talent on the outside. That That's checklist one. Uh, number one, you're not as bad as everybody's telling you. That rookie year doesn't dictate what your career is going to look like. Just go in and be Bryce Young. Don't try to be C.J. Stroud. Don't try to live up to the expectations of whoever is going to go number one, maybe Caleb Williams this year. Just be Bryce Young. It was good enough for a Heisman Trophy, and it was it, it will be good. It was good enough for a number one overall pick. So those are the things. But now when I talk about the X's and O's, the thing that I saw from Bryce Young, and it had to do with a lot of things, right? The protection, the separation of the wide receivers. You have a pass catching tight end. You got to get the ball out of your hands. 
that clock has to speed up for Bryce Young. He has to hit that back foot. The ball has to be out. And that comes with decisive uh, you know, reads and getting the ball to the wide receivers. They have to separate. And a lot of that has to do with Dave Canales. But for Bryce Young, don't hold the ball. Defensive ends like myself, those edge guys, they're 4-4 guys. They can track you down. They're going to be on you in a blink of an eye. So get the ball out of your hands. And then, you know, just work on anticipating. You're not going to throw to open receivers. It's not the SEC. It won't be Alabama. Trust what you see. Rip the ball. Let it go. Don't overthink it. And I think Bryce Young is going to be just fine. I was not discouraged by what I saw from Bryce Young. Did I like it? Absolutely not. It was not good at times. But I think there were so many other factors that he didn't get, I believe, uh, a fair enough look at what he could be. Is he going to be an all pro? I don't know, but he's certainly going to be 10 times better than we saw in 2023. Yeah. Al Wallace, uh, former defensive end for the Carolina Panthers, uh, my guest today here on Inside the Vault. Al, it's been such a great time getting you on the podcast and uh, going deep inside Carolina Panthers football. Uh, I'll get you out of here with some predictions, uh, and we can all go watch the uh, College Football National Championship game. We're recording this on uh, Monday night. Purdue and UConn coming up here shortly. Um, best offensive move that the Panthers made this offseason? What 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 would you would you like best? Man, it, you know, I'm a, I am played on the line. I want to say Robert Hunt because uh, I'm a South Florida guy, and, and I know my friends and family all were sad to see him go away from that offensive line, a physical and rugged guy. But I'm going to go Deontay Johnson because I think you finally have a route-running wide receiver that can create some separation, that certainly can get the ball in his hands and make people miss and, and take it the distance. And I know there were some inconsistencies catching the ball and those types of things. Don't worry about that. Sometimes your situation doesn't fit. Uh, this guy is going to be really good. He's going to be good for Bryce Young. And I think Dave Canales has the guy that he can pair up with Bryce and that skill set and get the ball to. So, yeah, I'm going to go with the wide receiver. I love the offensive lineman. Those two guards are, are going to help. Um, Bryce Young significantly you got to get better play out of Icky I know we didn't talk to him I thought a disappointing season as well from the second year left tackle a guy that has to be the man on the blind side of Bryce Young for a long time he has to figure that out but the best move on the offensive side of the ball was getting that number one receiver I do think with either 33 or 39 coming up here in a couple of weeks they're going to double down on that and get the future of that position, but it's Deontay Johnson. This guy's a game breaker, and this team hasn't had that guy since DJ Moore uh, was traded away. It's going to be fun to see if Bryce and um, Deontay can can connect. Yeah, speaking of the draft, 33 and 39 are um, the first two picks for the Panthers unless any trades are involved. Uh, you see most people talking about receiver, center, and uh, defensive end are the biggest needs. Um, so you think the Panthers are going to double dip at receiver at 33 and 39 is kind of your bold prediction there. Is that what I'm hearing? No, I think they're going to go receiver, uh, whether it's A.D. Mitchell or one of those guys that find themselves at the top of the, the second round there at 33. I love McConkey. I'm last. Yeah, McC you look at Xavier Leggett, who, you know, big contingency was there to watch him perform. Yeah. Another big physical D.K. Metcalf, uh, Mike Evans, big rangy body kind of guy that's really raw. Uh, Xavier Worthy, who's the speed guy in the draft. Any one of those guys in position – McConkey, of course, I'm not going to bat an eye. Then I think with 39, you got to go back to the line of scrimmage. So either a center uh, is going to be there. I know Austin Corbett is, is the guy that we're, we're penciling in to kind of slide from that right guard position into center. But how comfortable is he there? Uh, how many you know years or snaps has he played there? I think he can do it coming off of back-to-back -back seasons with injuries, but you better find the future. And I don't have the guy's name in front of me. There's a kid. Zach West Frazier Virginia. from West Virginia. Oh, uh, yeah. So Callahan, I believe the Panthers has been talking about him a lot. Yeah, yeah. Smart guy. Um, you know, high school, state championship wrestler, all those types of things. You know, grip strength. Those are the, the, the guys, the things that you need to make you a great center. I think that rounds out an offensive line. So I'm really thinking a wide receiver – and then offensive line. I know linebacker you can throw in there uh, just because yeah, maybe. of the stage. Uh, and then cornerback. You always need depth yeah. with a passing league, more bodies to throw in there and develop at the cornerback position. Yeah, I, I know tight end. Some people are shockingly uh, still – they don't know why we didn't address that, but that could be maybe one of the later rounds as well. We'll yeah. see on that. 
Um, what is your goal for year one of Dave Canales and Dan Morgan here in charge? Because some fans, they they say, you know, it's not about the wins and losses. It's about Bryce Young's development, and that is it. Um, and then some people say the division's up for grabs. Tampa might be taking a step back. New Orleans, we don't know about them. And Kirk Cousins is coming off an Achilles, and Atlanta has not lived up to their potential with all those uh, starters on offense. Uh from uh, Bijan, though we know he is good, uh, and then Kyle Pitts is kind of an injury prone. So, uh, what are your thoughts on year uh, and goal? Uh, kind of goal for year one, I would say, for the Canales era. Um, I, I'm going to look at Jonathan Gannon and the Arizona Cardinals, right? And not a very good football team, but I saw that team compete at a really high level in losses, and I think that's the goal. I don't think maybe like everybody else, and I've heard Canales and Morgan say this, I wholeheartedly don't believe that it's about Bryce Young. Now, just think about it. Uh, Scott Fitterer and whoever was in the room decided to bring Bryce Young in and make him the number one overall pick. I'm not saying Dan wasn't in on that. I'm not telling you Canales and Morgan don't believe in that. But if this thing doesn't go right with him, they're not going to hitch their wagon to him. That's just the NFL. So I believe the goal of this team is not about developing Bryce Young. Do you need to and do you want to? Absolutely. You would be a fool not to think that is the quickest path to getting some success here. But it's going to be a team in a season that's going to be marked with a transition away from a team that for me looked soft, that wasn't competitive, that didn't look invested, that did not love their coaching staff and maybe one another through this whole process. And remember, I played on the 2002, 2003 team. Uh, we're all still brothers. We fought for each other and it wasn't about the talent. And we found ourselves in Houston. Um, so you can't get it turned around. I don't know that the Panthers are going to go on some, in, uh, you know, NFC South run where it's, man, I can't believe the Panthers are in a position to win the South. I don't believe that. But what I will see is signs of this team under Dan Morgan and Dave Canales getting back to physical, scrappy, fighting at the line of scrimmage football. And that is what I saw from uh, Jonathan Gannon's uh, Arizona Cardinals, a team that lost a lot of games, as many games as the Carolina Panthers, but certainly looked good doing it. They went out there and fought. Go look at the, the Las Vegas Raiders, right? Not very good. But with the right coach and Antonio Pierce, they found something to fight for. Go look at the 2022 Carolina Panthers under Steve Wilkes, right? Terrible team. A lot of the same guys, but they fought. Can you do that for 18 weeks, 17 uh, games under Dave Canales? Then you feel good about going into 2025 uh, taking that big leap. I think there we'll see the more significant win total uh, jump in 2025. So for this year, go out and compete, man. Get back to keep pounding. Make me believe you're still the Carolina Panthers and you're taking on some of the identity of the new general manager. Yeah, that uh, that's a good way to say the state of the Panthers currently. Um, a good way to summarize that. My last question for you, give me your boldest prediction for 2024 version of the Carolina Panthers. What do you got? Man, the boldest prediction, uh, I'm rooting for J.C. Horn. I think J.C. Horn is a that's top really five answer. cornerback in the NFL I believe this year he proves that and he's going to become a premier uh, lockdown cornerback in the NFL. He is going to uh, go out and show everyone uh, why he was drafted so high, why it is in his DNA to be one of the baddest men playing the position. So I'm looking for one J.C. Horn to stay healthy. And when he does, he's going to become a household name. He's going to get thrust into that stratosphere of elite cornerback. And that is going to be so great for Zero of Vero's defense. So my boldest prediction um, is that he's going to stay healthy. He's going to go out there and he's going to kill it, man. He's going to do a great job of being that number one lockdown corner, which is going to help the pass rush. It's going to help the linebackers. It's going to help this team win way more football games. than I believe everybody is going to predict when we go into this season. Well, that's a great place to end it. As I said at the top, my guest today has been Al Wallace, former defensive end for the Carolina Panthers, uh, University of Maryland product. Uh, Al, thanks so much for coming on the show today, and uh, we'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you having me on, buddy. Thank you. And that'll wrap up this episode of Inside the Vault, episode number 32 a Carolina Panthers podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Smith. Rate, review, subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and we will see you next time.